So finally, 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 I have finally been able to make this video as I've promised a few months ago. And finally, I'm here to actually explain to you guys and show you how the actual blockchain works. If most of you still don't know what the blockchain is, It's basically the backbone technology behind Bitcoin. Now, this video is nothing to do with the actual investments. It's purely an educational thing, just to explain to people about what's going on in the actual space. So it's taken a lot of actual work to get here, but I hope in some sort of way, you guys walk away with a bit of value today. Let's go. So as many of you may or may not know, the underlying technology that supports Bitcoin and many other cryptocurrencies is referred to as the blockchain. It is this technological advancement that has in fact the greatest potential to disrupt how information is stored and transacted in a digital space. Bitcoin is a digital currency that was initially created as the answer to the 2008 recession. The 2008 recession was a direct result of banks creating money out of thin air and loaning that money out with interest. This newfound money inflated the housing markets, often pushing prices up to ridiculously high levels. When that bubble eventually popped, people were left with massive, massive debts that they could not afford to repay. This resulted in a huge shortage of liquidation within banks as it pushed the nation closer and closer to the verge of total economic collapse. So Bitcoin aims to solve this by creating a currency that was not subject to inflation. Essentially, it was created as a system that took power away from financial institutions and placed it back in the hands of the ordinary civilian. So let's take a look at how the traditional banking system works compared to transactions proposed by blockchain. So there are many thousands of banks and credit unions that exist in the world. Each have their own set of customers, rates and general rules that they abide by when it comes to transacting money. So because of this, if Sally wants to transfer £300 to Kev, who belongs to a different banking institution and lives in a completely different country, Sally's funds would essentially be transferred from bank to bank through various routes before actually being received by Kev. As this process happens, many institutions take their cut in the form of fees. And depending on how much money has actually been sent, those fees could soon add up to quite a lot of money. But instead, on a blockchain, the individual is able to send a transaction directly to the intended recipient and therefore removing the third party entirely. So all this happens through a peer-to-peer -peer network. So a peer-to-peer -peer network is essentially a network of computers or devices that share and transact data or information between them. One of the benefits of a peer-to-peer -peer network is the more devices that you actually add, the faster and more reliable the network actually becomes. But through the use of modern cryptography, the peer-to-peer -peer network has been transformed and essentially becomes much more secure and much more of a tool of the future. So what exactly is cryptography? Cryptography is the process of converting data into unintelligible form, therefore encrypting data and locking it in a form that is both unreadable and uneditable by anyone other than the intended recipient. Using cryptography, a sender can send and transact any data safely and securely with confidence knowing that the information being transacted is in fact uncompromised and deemed to be true. It also offers cases where neither the sender nor the receiver can deny that the transaction was actually performed. So to understand this a little bit more, we need to create a mock transaction on the blockchain. So to own or transact in Bitcoin, a user would essentially require a digital wallet. A digital wallet can simply be described as a set of two keys, a public key and a private key. 
a public key can be thought of almost like an email address, as this is perfectly safe to be shared with anyone both online or offline. It is this key that people would need in order to send a transaction to your address. The private key, however, acts like a password as it gives the holder complete access and control to the stored funds associated with that address. So in a simple form, a public key is used to receive transactions, whereas a private key is used to send transactions. Obviously, from a technical standpoint, the actual processes would actually be a lot different than what I've explained here. It's actually a lot more complex, but essentially, as just an understanding point, it's a good place to start from here. So, let's look a little further into the process of performing a transaction. So let's say Sally wants to transfer 0.2 Bitcoin to Steve. Steve would first need to provide Sally with his public key. Sally creates a request to pay Steve. The digital request is then passed through a hash algorithm, which ensures that the data cannot be seen nor changed. This is then combined with a combination of Sally's public key and a private key to sign and encrypt the transactional request. So quick note, a hash is basically a numeric value which directly represents any data input. This digital code is unique in the sense that if any input of the data was to be changed, then the numeric output would be completely different. This makes it almost impossible for anyone to determine the input data based on the output hash. So, once the transaction has gone through the encryption process, the transaction then moves on into a transaction pool which is essentially a pool of pending transactions on the network. The transactions in this space are waiting to be picked up by miners. So miners are computers or sets of computers that are all connected and devoted to trying to solve transactions on a blockchain. Miners essentially get paid in Bitcoin for managing to verify these transactions. This pool of pending transactions are placed into blocks. A mathematical problem is automatically generated based on all the transactions that have been added into that particular block. This mathematical problem is what all the miners are competing to solve. If a mining rig manages to solve this problem first, it is then rewarded with Bitcoin before it places the newly solved block on top of the global chain. So in essence, the global ledger has now been updated and essentially Steve receives his Bitcoin from Sally. So once a block is successfully mined, the block is then added to the top layer of the blockchain. The blockchain is essentially built up of many blocks which all gone through the exact same process before being stacked in an uneditable chain of transactional data. So each block holds data relating to its current transaction but it also holds data from all previous transactions. All that information is still stored within that same new block. So the traditional way that we imagine a balance sheet to be structured kind of looks like this. Steve's account has 1.2 Bitcoin in it. Sally's account has 0.5 Bitcoin. And Mark's account has 0.225 Bitcoin. In fact, on the blockchain, the way the balance should be visualized kind of looks like this. So this alphanumeric code actually represents Sally's account. So as you can see, each account holder has all the information as to where they got their Bitcoin from in the first place. Storing transactional data in this way allows the system to be traced backwards. So if we were to follow the transactions backwards, Using this block as the starting point, it would look something like this. So based on this information, we can look at the previous state in the chain to see where Bill got this 0.25 Bitcoin in the first place. In this block, we can see that Bill was able to pay Sally because he received a total of 0.7 Bitcoin from Frank. 
So in this way, we should be able to see how the transactions are all linked to each other. And you would be able to actually trace each transaction and go back to previous blocks to see where individuals got their money from. So in this way, it creates a traceable breadcrumb, one that if followed would eventually lead back to the very first transaction. So if we trace all the transactions, we'd eventually get back to what is known as the Genesis block. The Genesis block is a unique block as it is the very first block to exist on the chain. It is from this block that all following code is based upon. The hash code created in this block becomes the basis for every other block that follows in the chain. So as we mentioned before, if a single digit in the input data is changed, then the entire hash outcome would also change. So as more and more transactions get added in the form of blocks, they each carry over all the previous hash information, creating an undeniable, uneditable link that confirms all values to be true. So, say Batman was to come along and attempt to manipulate the data of a particular block and essentially create a claim that he in fact owned 1 billion Bitcoin. Then that change in digital input would affect the hash output of the entire blockchain. So if a situation like this was to ever actually occur, then what is needed on a network is a consensus protocol that helps to differentiate what is untrue and what is true. So what exactly is consensus protocol? Well, essentially, it's the layer on the blockchain that makes the blockchain decentralized. Consensus protocol is the rules set to determine what is true or untrue on a blockchain. So on the blockchain network, instead of there existing only one copy of the chain, there is in fact thousands of copies of this chain. Each node on the network has voting power that helps decide if something is true or false. In the case of a copy of the blockchain being compromised, then the rest of the network will undergo a set of rules to determine whether that block is real or fake. If the network reaches a consensus that the chain is in fact fake, then the compromised chain is then ignored, and the official chain will continue as normal. It is this part of the technology that really has the greatest impact on how we store and transact digital information, rather than being in a centralized location. If data is in a centralized location, then it creates a centralized failure point if that centralized data or institution manages to get compromised then essentially the whole system shuts down whereas if you have a decentralized system a particular chain gets compromised then the rest of the chains actually continue to function and that particular corrupt chain is ignored so by storing information in immutable blocks, we are able to create a whole new type of ecosystem, one that could apply to many things that we use in today. So for example, title deeds to property. There's still countries in the world that have paper title deeds in the sense that if that paper was to burn or get lost or float away in a flood or something of a sort, then essentially there is nothing actually proving that a farmer or a landowner actually owns that land. Placing it on a blockchain where it's immutable is probably the best way forward in this modern day that we're now moving into. Anyway guys, that is me. I hope you've gained some sort of value in these videos. I hope you take away a bit of knowledge. If you believe that there's people out there who will benefit from this video, give it a quick share, share it about, you know, I'm not shy. We want to do a quick vote for the next video. If you want to know a bit more about investing, exchanges, do's and don'ts, trading techniques, that sort of stuff, then please hit us with a, a like. If you want to see more videos like this that break down the technical aspects, then hit us with a, a love art. And we'll see you in the next video. Bye.